All right, so today let's go ahead and review our substitution and elimination reactions. Um, I'm a big fan of this cartoon here. It basically illustrates the essentials of what the SN1 and SN2 were. I am hoping this is all review because this is all covered last semester. So in this analogy here, we have our substrate. And the substrate is the compound, the main organic compound that's reacting. The reagent is whatever else you're reacting with. So in this case, I would go ahead and call the cat bed with the gray cat the substrate. And then the orange cat will be your, uh, your reagent. And the, the, the main not notable difference is how the leaving group and nucleophile attack. Uh, the overall net result at the end is a net substitution, though. So in this case here, the, the, the leaving group, the gray cat, leaves on its own. And then the orange cat comes in. Uh, what is the role of the orange cat? What is, besides reagent, what was the other word we can use? It was nucleophile, right? So that, that is your nucleophile. Don't worry, we're going to do some real actual arrow pushing and whatnot today too, <laughs> not just cartoons. And then we have the second case here uh, where the, uh, the nucleophile comes and attacks and then the leaving group leaves simultaneously, uh, leaving with the net substitution. All right, uh, which one of them has a stereospecific product? It was the SN2. Um, what was the, st the stereochemistry on the SN1? Racemic. Why is it racemic? What's that? Yeah, so you have the carbocation intermediate. It can attack from any direction. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, switch over to some actual writing now so we can see how this all works out. And I'm hoping we have enough time to, at least, I, I at least wanted to get through SN1, SN2, E1, E2 today, and maybe the addition reactions. Um, however far we get today, though, that's the end of the OCHEM 1 review. So however far we get today. All right, so I have a general substrate here that I'm going to use uh, for all four different SN1, SN2, E1, E2 reactions. Oops. Use the purple one. All right, so that's showing up okay. Looks like it's showing up okay on my, my end. All right, let's go ahead and put a leaving group over here. Oops, the zoom keeps changing. All right, so here we have our bromine leaving group. And I have a couple different reagents we're gonna use. So let's go ahead and say we have this two options. We have four options total. And I'm hoping nobody in this class is colorblind because I like to use different colors to label things. So I think uh, let's just go ahead and say NaOH. All right, so we're going to show two different situations for what NaOH can do. So what do you guys think is going to happen here is uh, if NaOH's reacts will undergo and let's think about substitution for now. Will it be uh, SN1 or SN2, do you think? So, so there's a couple things you go through to figure out which, which one it is, right? What was the first thing that you look at? The structure of the substrate. So if it, if it, if it prefers SN1, if it's primary, if it, or, or is that right? Prefers oh, it's SN1 is for uh, tertiary, prefers SN1 because of the carbocation intermediate. And then primary prefers SN2. Uh, in the case where it is secondary, you have to go to the next thing. So, what was the next thing in importance for figuring out which one it was? Was it the nucleophile or the leaving group? The nucleophile is more important. So in this case now, we then look at the strength of the nucleophile. So looking at hydroxide, is hydroxide a weak nucleophile or a strong nucleophile? Strong. It's, a, it's considered a strong nucleophile. Uh, the way you can think about this is, uh, in general, there is a general correlation between basicity and nucleophilicity. So if it's a strong base, hydroxide is a pretty strong base, it's going to act as a stronger nucleophile. 
So I'm going to go ahead and show the two options for uh, this here. And let's go ahead and show it under Go and SN2. So here, I am being very particular on the orientation of the arrow. And it's because I want to imply the backside attack. And for those of you having for the first time, don't freak out too much about me not writing everything down. That's why I'm recording. <laughs> it's for you guys who have these notes as well. So don't, don't be writing frantically down everything I'm saying. All right, so I go ahead and uh, predict the product here. So the way I recommend uh, predicting SN2 products is you just keep the carbon backbone the same and just flip the stereochemistry on the carbon here. So we get that. Other product here. So the other, uh, what was the other option for hydroxide now? So what, uh, what reaction competes with the SN2? We could have an acid-base situation here, but in, in, in particular, I'm looking for E2 is what I wanted to hear. All right, so uh, in an E2 elimination, we can make sure it's elimination by at, uh, changing the conditions a little bit. So uh, if we wanted to have temperature considerations here, how can we favor elimination over substitution? Heat it. Yeah, so I'm just going to specify heat here just to make sure that we're getting our elimination product here. And I'm going to go ahead and do this in red, E2. All right, so now with the situation for E2, uh, the substrate structure is not as important for the SN2 because we are attacking one carbon away, right? So uh, what I recommend doing is you go ahead and draw out the H's on all of the adjacent carbons. Um, I'm hoping you're at the point now where you, you've practiced this enough where you don't actually have to write these all out. So now we have to make a choice between which H's it's gonna grab. So I'm hearing you're saying that it's gonna grab the left one. Why is it gonna grab the left one? You wanna end up with a more substituted alkene and what was the word for that product we used? Markovnikov. Not Markovnikov. Uh, just throwing out random <laughs> organic <laughs> chemistry words out. Uh, so it was it was the Zaystev's product. Yes, Zaystev's product. Sorry, I didn't. Did you say it? I, sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, to ensure that you're getting the Zaystev product. Uh, you want to grab the H that is on the more substituted position because that'll give you the more substituted product. So I'm going to go ahead and draw both products, but I'm going to show the arrows to give the major product. So you go ahead and grab the H. So the red arrows here are for the E2. We get the new double bond. Kick out the leaving group. All right, so then we get this product here, and we call this the Zaystev's product. So that was the Zaystev's. Basically, it's more substituted. Okay, so uh, now I want to go ahead and change this reagent here, and we're going to continue with E2 for now. So what if we uh, change it to that base? So we have a bulky base here. Potassium terpetoxide is a bulky base. So uh, we, I'm kind of running out of room for arrows here. So let's go ahead and predict the product. So we're going to get the Hoffman product. So this was the Hoffman less substituted. All right, so the, the question I have for uh, the third reaction here is, would you have an, an SN2 as a minor product, do you think? No. Or why not? Because the from the backside attack. Yep, so uh, if you have a bulky base, these cannot undergo SN2 because they are too bulky for the backside attack. That is the, a, a major limiting factor of the SN2s, that if you have a bulky nucleophile, it cannot come in. 
<clears throat> All right. And I think I'm just going to go ahead and erase this last part here. And just I'm just going to redraw it down below because I think we're running out of room. All right. Are there any questions so far about the FN, FN2, E2 reactions? Um, do you guys remember what the rate law is? So does it involve one species or two species? It involves two. That's where the twos come from. So uh, a common misconception students have is that they think that the numbers on here indicate the number of steps. They actually indicate the number of compounds in the rate law. So here uh, for the rate law, the rate is going to be K times the nucleophile or base times the substrate. So if I double the concentration of hydroxide, it should double the rate. If I double the concentration of both the substrate and the nucleophile, it should quadruple the rate. Okay. I'm trying to think what else we can talk about here. All right, so for the nucleophile or base, um, I did make some distinctions on when we use those words. So in which case is hydroxide acting as a nucleophile? SN... Two. So we say the word nucleophile when it's attacking a carbon. When it's attacking an H, it's acting as a base. Um, that terminology will come up throughout the semester as well. I was wondering, for bulkier base, could you like, define it like it would be going either E2 or SN1? Or for bulky bases? Yeah. Uh, typically, bulky bases are pretty strong nucleophiles also. They tend to go the, the bimolecular route, oh. the second order ones. So it's Correct. For, uh, if you have a bulky base, it's only E2. Uh, the main time you have to consider that is when you have a small base. When, then you have to consider your SN2 or E2s. Um, there's a, rest a major restriction for these second order reactions here. Uh, these don't work well with alcohols. So alcohols are your OH compounds. So suppose I were to uh, just say, this is try a different substrate here. And let's not work. All right, so let's go ahead and make it a chiral center. So suppose I had the idea that, oh, I want to just go ahead and run an SN2 on this to, as a way to flip the stereochemistry on this carbon. Um, what is the problem with using hydroxide for this? We have a poor leaving group. So if you have a poor leaving group in an OH, you have a major competing reaction here that is not an elimination. What is the other competing reaction that can happen here? Acid base can happen instead. So uh, likely what's going to happen here is you're not going to get your substitution product. You're instead going to get the acid base product. And right now, so if we're worrying about mass balance, what is the other product here? Water. Yep, water. So remember that when you're balancing your acid-base reactions, we always have an acid and a base on one side and an acid and a base on the other. So here we have our acid, conjugate base, base, conjugate acid. Which side of the equilibrium do you think would dominate here? It's gonna kind of roughly be equal, though. You remember how to make a prediction on which side the equilibrium lies on? Do you guys remember the pKa of, of, of alcohols? Fifteen to sixteen range. What about the pKa of water? Yeah, so it's gonna be they're gonna be pretty equal. Uh, essentially, what happens is whichever side has the weaker acid is which side dominates. And don't worry, I, I was planning on revisiting the acid-base stuff in more detail when we get to the carboxylic acid chapter. <laughs> it's pretty important. So yeah, we'll, re we'll revisit this, this PKA stuff again this semester. So if you don't remember, don't freak out too bad. All right, uh, let's go ahead and switch over to, oh, one last thing here, I keep saying one last thing, I keep thinking of a thing to talk about. All right, going back here, 
when talking about the Zaystep versus the Hoffman reaction here, are we talking about something being stereospecific or regiospecific? Or regioselective, I mean. Yeah, regioselective. So when we use a regioselective, that means that you're getting just one of your different stereo or constitutional isomers. So you can think of it as region selective. So you're going to get the double bond in a predictable region. And then what was the word we used for this one? Stereo. That was stereo selective. Stereo selective means that you get one stereo isomer. So this is stereo selective. All right. So works well with that, blah, blah, blah. All right. So go ahead and switch over to the uh, first order reactions. I'm going to go ahead and use the same substrate that we used in the last example. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and use water as my reagent. It's also the solvent. So if you have a situation where you have the solvent, it's also the reagent, what was the word that we used? So it, once again, if the, reagent is, if the reagent is also the solvent, what is the word that we use? It's solvolysis is the word. Uh, solvation is referring to something going in solution. Yeah, so solvolysis is pretty characteristic of your SN1s. And uh, because of the way this mechanism works, I want to go ahead and just predict the products up here, then we'll do the mechanism down below. So to ensure the first order elimination, I'm going to go ahead and put the heat on that one. So this one will likely be the SN1 route. And then we'll use red again for the elimination. will be E1. Okay, predict the products. So now we have to consider a couple things here about uh, where the OH is going to go. Um, do you think the OH is going to go right here? It's going to, or is it going to go over, over to the left? Yep, we're going to have a hydride shift here. I'll, we're, we'll do the mechanism here in a second. We are going to have a hydride shift. So I got somewhat of a trick question here. Is, uh, would this product be racemic? This example? No, it's achiral. But in general, typically, uh, if it is a chiral center, your product is going to be racemic for an SN1. All right, uh, for the E1 product here, you're going to have the same product as the E2 had. It just works out that way for this example. All right, so mechanism, good times. We've got a lot of mechanisms to go over this class. I should show you a little preview of some of the mechanisms coming up this semester. Or maybe not, I'll scare you guys away if I do that. All right, so uh, here we have our uh, rate determining step is the leaving group leaving. So we're going to get a carbocation. And then while I'm talking about that rate determining step here, so the rate determining step is uh, the slowest step in your reaction, it governs your rate law. So should I include the water as part of that rate law here? This is my rate determining step. Does water affect that step in any way? No, it's not involved yet. So the rate law here for both SN1 and E1 is going to be K times the concentration of the substrate. All right. Um, here, when, uh, every single time you have a carbocation form, you want to consider the possibility of rearrangements. The main ones we went over were hydride shifts and alkyl shifts. Uh, the motivation behind this is that you get a more stable carbocation at the end. So uh, we have choices here. We can have this H move over or the one over here. It's going to be this one because if this H moves over, we get a tertiary carbocation. If this one were to move over, it would be primary. We don't want primary carbocations. So we're going to go ahead and do this hydride shift here. 
Uh, once again here, the driving force behind this is the generation of a more stable carbocation. So a secondary, tertiary. Remember that the more substituted your carbocation is, the more stable it is. So nature's gonna prefer to, to want this one to form over this one. At this point, after you have the more stable carbocation form, uh, for the SN1 and the E1, up to here is identical. So now we have to consider what's gonna, what the water is gonna do now. So now the water can come in, it can do a, a nucleophilic attack, or it can act as a base. So if it does a nucleophilic attack, let's go ahead and go down this way. And I think we'll have elimination go down this way. So here, let's go ahead and say water. This, I wanna go ahead and show it act as a nucleophile, meaning it's attacking a non-H. It's gonna attack the carbocation here. Um, don't forget about this step here. You're not quite done yet because you still have an extra H attached. Like so. And I need to remove this H. Like that. And if I'm worrying about other products here, what is my other product here for mass balance? Oh, yep, hydronium ion, H3O plus. Like so. In a lot of reactions that we're gonna see this semester, this H3O plus reforming is a catalyst. So you have to show a catalyst reforming here. I don't think it's acting as a catalyst here though. All right, and then for your H2O, Again, so the first path we went, we showed it acting as a, as a nucleophile. The other path, we're gonna show it act as a base. So when I say acting as a base, it means it's attacking an H. That, you double bond, and there are no additional steps here. We are now done. And then same as the last uh, reaction here, the other product is the hydronium ion. All right. Um, there is some built-in review for this stuff. Uh, we'll see some more tomorrow. Uh, if, if you actually read ahead and look at the alcohol chapter, it's pretty much just SN1, SN2 in that chapter and eliminations. So uh, I don't want to go too much with the alcohol stuff here because we'll see a lot of it tomorrow.